Hello and welcome to our first ever on this channel, New Year's Special. In this two-part mini-series, we're going to be creating a card game from start to finish to get the new year started off on the right foot. In this video mini-series, this two-part series, we're going to be creating a game. It's a card game. It's Memory. If you're not familiar with the card game Memory, it's a fairly simple to play game but it is a moderately complex little project. In this game, if you're not familiar, you have a deck of cards. In this version that we're making, which you can actually go ahead and play for yourself, it's actually finished and up on the web. It's at borncg.itch.io forward slash memory. If you go there, you can play it for yourself. When you play memory, you have the job of flipping over two cards at once. And if they match, well, you found a pair. In other words, if you find two jacks or two sevens, if you flip them over and you find them, that's great. You can keep them flipped over. If they do not match, if you flip over like an eight and a two, well, you have to flip them back face down and keep looking for pairs. You can only flip two cards at once. So if I click on a card, I get an ace. If I get, click on another card, I get a nine. Those don't match, so they automatically flip back over in this game. If I try two other ones, a seven and an eight and a queen, then they aren't a match, they flip back over. And hopefully over time I can remember, that's why it's called memory, where cards are and I can go back and find the cards that I already know where they are. And the quicker I can do it, the better. And in fewer moves, the better. So if I flip over fewer cards to get them all flipped over, that's great. You win the game when all the cards are flipped over. You've identified 26 pairs in this case. If you're new to my channel, my name is Colin. I'm a high school computer science and digital media teacher. I've also been leading creative technology summer camps with elementary and middle school kids since about 2006. And on this YouTube channel, I primarily teach two pieces of software, Blender and Godot. Since about 2011, I've been teaching Blender for 3D modeling and 3D animation and game making. And about two years ago, I started teaching Godot. In this video project, which will span two videos, I am expecting that you have some familiarity with either programming or in the Godot game engine. In my Godot series, I've covered how to create two simple games from start to finish. I have a mini series on how to create a simple 3D game in the Godot game engine, and I'm still not finished it, but I have another series called Let's Build a 2D Platformer Game in which we make a 2D platformer. And if you're in the middle of watching that series and you're like, hey, he's not done yet. I'm not. I still will be making more videos in that series. I'm just making this two-part uh, New Year special for the sake of having a new year on the calendar to look forward to 2021. If you are brand new to Godot, I highly recommend that you check out those two or one of those two tutorial mini-series and see what Godot is all about, especially if you've never done any programming before. Uh, ever check those out before uh, continuing with this video or at least trying this project for yourself. It might be a bit too advanced. In this two-part New Year's special, we'll be diving into some higher level to moderate programming concepts, including creating classes. Classes are files that you can use as blueprints in, in most programming languages, um, as well as using constructors to create a class. We'll also be getting into looking at how to use arrays to keep track of multiple variables of the same type. In this case, an array of plain cards, which will be their own objects or classes. We'll be using loops and iteration to go through an entire array of cards. So loops is important. And we'll be really programming this project using principles of modularity and reusability. And we'll be making our whole project a little bit better organized than in the past and dividing code up into chunks called functions. So get ready for all those kind of more moderately difficult aspects of programming if you are a beginner programmer. For these two videos, I'm going to be using the version of Godot, which you can get from godotengine.org. It is version 3.2.3. .3. That's the newest version as of right now. And of course, if you like this video or if you learned something in it, please go ahead and click on that like button below this video. It really helps out me and my channel. And if you want to see more videos like this one in the Godot game engine or in Blender or other technology, click on that subscribe button as well and the bell icon to be notified whenever I upload a new tutorial. So let's go ahead and jump into creating this project. To make this project along with me, you're going to need to download this folder here. It's called Assets, and I'm giving you a link to download it as a zip file below this video on YouTube in the description area below. When you get this file or this folder, it'll be a zip file. You'll need to unzip it, and then you'll need to add it into your project folder along with me a little bit later in this video. So once you have that, go ahead and open up Godot. In Godot, you might have some projects in your project manager. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of that one that I've already removed 
uh, previously, and you should have maybe an empty list here or a list of other old projects, go ahead and press new project. This is how you make a new project in Godot. In Godot, you need to make a new project in an empty folder on your computer. I'm gonna make a folder on my desktop. That's the easiest way, I think. So I'm gonna right click on my desktop and say new folder. And I'm gonna name this folder memory, M-E-M-O-R-Y. And uh, I'm gonna press enter. And now I'm gonna browse for it here with the browse button. It'll automatically name your project the same as your folder name once you navigate to it. So I'll press browse. I'm gonna go from my documents folder up one folder to my user folder uh, on my Windows computer. And then I'll go into my desktop folder where I have my folder called memory. I need to go into that, so I'll double click. Now that I'm inside that empty folder, I can press select current folder. And now I have a little green check mark. You won't get that until you navigate using this browse button to an empty folder on your computer. Lastly, I need to change the renderer to OpenGL ES2. This makes your whole project more compatible with more devices and more compatible when you wanna go export your game if you wanna publish your game to the internet, like to a website like itch.io where my game is hosted, okay? So my project name is memory. It's going to be made in a folder right here and OpenGL ES2, I'll press create and edit. The Godot editor will open and I'm assuming that you're familiar at least a little bit with the Godot editor. You have workspaces along the top. You've got your 2D workspace. We'll be making some parts of our game here, but largely we'll be making our game programmatically in code. We'll also have the script editor, which we'll be working in a whole lot. You've got docs along the left-hand side. You've got your scene doc, which is where you make nodes to build the scenes. You have your file system doc below that, which is your project folder. You have your inspector, which shows you properties of the object that you're currently selecting over in your scene doc. And of course you have your main workspace in the middle. Right now, if I go to 2D, you can see the size of my 2D game window right here. It's a little bit too small for my liking. So right away, I'm gonna go up to project, project settings. And I'm gonna go, this is where you change the settings of your entire project. I'm gonna go to the first tab called general, and then I'm gonna scroll down in the sidebar to the section called display window. This is where you can change properties of your game screen, how big the window of your game is. The width and height are the default 1024 by 600. I'm gonna change those to 1280, 1280, and I'll press tab by 800. So a bigger, more widescreen aspect ratio. I'll press tab or click somewhere else to make those uh, changes uh, permanent. And I'll press close. So 1280 by 800, there we go. Our game screen is now a little bit bigger. You might not notice that, but it is. So we need to make our scene. We have an empty scene right now by default. We need to make it the game, but our game is actually not gonna have a whole lot in it. Just really a background and a grid to put cards in. And that's gonna be, be really it for this video. We're gonna make a card and we're gonna make our cards load into our game programmatically. So this new scene is not gonna have a whole lot in it. We're gonna separate things into different parts, uh, especially code files in this project. So in our new empty scene, we're gonna press this user interface button. That's gonna make our node tree have a root node of what's called a control node. Our game is essentially a user interface. It's really just buttons and uh, display text and things like that, like labels and panels. It's not really a game like a platformer where you have like sprites and you know enemies walking around. It's just really buttons that can change their texture. So this control node is perfect for that. It's good for user interface elements. I'm gonna double click on the control name. So I'll rename this node to game with a capital G. And I'm going to give this game a colored background that's not gray. So I'm gonna select the root node, press plus. I'm gonna add what's called a color rect, color rectangle, color rect for short, all one word. I'm gonna double click to add that. It'll add it hopefully as a child node to your root node. That's how things work in Godot. You have node trees with, with parents. You have a root node at the, at the very top. You have children of it. And our color rectangle is a little square. Uh, with it selected, I can just click on the name of it right here. I'm gonna make sure it extends out and is actually anchored to the corners of my game window. So I'm gonna go to this layout menu with the color rectangle selected, and I'm gonna go to, under layout, full rectangle, or full rect. That will stretch out that color rectangle background to be the entire size, and it changes these little anchors, these little pins, so that the color rectangle will actually stretch with the window if that's what happens if your window gets uh, stretched to a different size. The color rectangle over here has properties. It has the anchor values, which uh, we've set. I believe at top should be really zero. 
and right should really be one. I'm not sure why it was different values, maybe because I moved them a little bit. We also need to change the color of this rectangle to be whatever you want the background of your game to be. Typically card games happen on old traditional like poker green felt table. So I'm gonna make it look uh, dark green, something like that. And our cards are not simply going to be placed you know, randomly on this table, they're gonna be in a nice grid. When I first tried making this project, I actually did math and I actually used coordinates X and Y to place the cards one by one, all 52 manually in this area. Yeah, don't do that. You're gonna select the root node of your game and you're gonna press plus and you're gonna add in what's called a grid container. So I'm gonna search for grid and you're gonna see it here. Containers in Godot are amazing for user interface elements. They can automatically space things uh, either horizontally or vertically, or in this case, both. So if I add a grid container and it's gonna be a child directly of the game root node, this grid, I'm gonna select it. I'm actually gonna rename it to grid, all lowercase. So it's gonna be easy for us to, to uh, type later on. I'm going to uh, select it and go up to layout and pin it or uh, stretch it to the full rectangle again of the game so it is not only the size of the entire game but it's also anchored to the corners which is nice but with that grid selected over in its properties i'm going to do a couple of things i'm going to change the columns so how many items will exist in rows to 13 so i can actually click in there and type 13. when i add items or cards into my game they are going to be children directly of this grid node. So they're gonna be in here, all listed here. We're gonna do it programmatically. So we're not gonna actually click, you know, the plus and add more cards. We're gonna do it kind of once the game loads and that way we can shuffle the cards and, you know, deal with them more, you know, with code. But we need to make sure that the cards don't go right to the edge of the screen. So I'm gonna select the grid also and change the margin of this grid node to uh, the left. I'm gonna say negative 40 uh, or pardon me, 40. And I'm gonna change the top to 40, so it's not going to the edge of the screen, and then write negative 40. That's where I got the other wrong value from. And the bottom, I'm gonna make the bottom only go to about there. I'm gonna say negative 240. And uh, that way we have room for our heads up display at the bottom, which will have like a timer and the score number of pairs flipped. It'll have the number of moves you've done and it'll have a play uh, or probably a pause and reset buttons, which we'll make in the next part of this two-part mini-series. Okay, so we've got our grid. Great, what about a card? Well, to make a playing card, we're actually gonna define a class. And a class in programming is basically a file that you set up to be the template or blueprint for a type of object. And then when you make that blueprint and you're running your game, you can make new instances of that blueprint of that object, in this case, a card and they all use that same template or blueprint. This is called object-oriented programming. To make a new class, I'm gonna make a new GD script file. Before I do that though, I'm forgetting one thing. My game scene is almost done. I'm gonna select the root node of my game scene. I'm gonna press the add script button. Our game will need to have its own script even though most code won't be even on our script. So game.gd will be, uh, we'll create it. It's gonna be GD script. The language it's going to inherit the control node that's the default we're going to use no comments as the template that'll just make the code cleaner and we'll call it game.gd the same name as the root node of the scene so i'll press create okay this game uh, scene its root node has a script there's very little on it that's okay i'll do a quick control s i have not saved this scene yet so i will name the scene game.tscn it'll name it in my project folder which is res and i'll press uh, save okay that means our scene for our game is pretty much done. I'll go back to the, the 2D workspace. We need to make a card and the card's gonna be a class. It's gonna be a GD script file, just like the game GD script. So I'm gonna right click down here where there's nothing there. When I right click, it gives me the option to make new things. I'm gonna make a new script. When I make a new script, when I right click, it gives me the option to choose the language. Importantly though, our card is going to be a button. In fact, it's gonna be a texture button. And there is a node kind uh, called it a texture button. And we're gonna make our card based on that texture button node in Godot. So when we say inherits, what we are talking about here is we're making a class that inherits everything that a texture button in Godot can do, but we get to customize it and add to it a little bit. And that's what we're gonna do. So I'm gonna click this little button here. This will bring up all the nodes that I can possibly make a card based on. And I'm gonna search for texture 
button with a lowercase t and uppercase b, all one word. There it is, texture button, actually uppercase t, but that's okay. Uh, texture button, and I'll double click. And uh, so this new script file will be based on that, and that means our texture button card will be a texture button, but even more than that. We're gonna make our template be based on no comments. That's fine, that's what we want. If yours says default, change it to no comments. We're gonna call this file, this is important, we're gonna change new script to card with a capital C dot GD. That's important. Usually you name classes with a capital letter, C for card, capital, okay? And I think that's it, GD script, texture button, card dot GD, res colon slash dash, and then create. When you create a new script file, it doesn't even open it for you. So let's go ahead and double click on card.gd. And you can see it says extends texture button. In order to make this, this file, this GD file, actually a class, we need to use the keyword class underscore name. So right below the first line of code where you have extends texture button, we're going to say class underscore name and then space card with a capital C. That's important. Okay. Now, when you make a class, you are going to have quite a lot of functions in this class. Underscore ready is the function that runs right when this card gets put in the game. When you actually deal a card and make it a child or make a new instance of the card, uh, this will get run right when the card gets put in the game. But our card should have more properties, more variables built into it that we're going to customize and make right now. A playing card needs to know what suit it is. And that's not based or baked or made part of a texture button by default. So I'm going to make a new variable here called suit, go figure. And we're not going to give it any value because when you make a template for a class, typically you would need to tell this card what suit it is when you make it, but not before you make it. So we're not going to give this like any equals or anything like that right away. Same thing with a value. A card can have a value. We're going to use numbers just like for suits. By the way, with suits, we're going to use numbers one, two, three, and four. So one will be spades, two will be hearts, three will be diamonds, and four will be clubs. Um, that follows the same ranking as, as suits in poker, I think. And we're going to have a variable called value. And value is going to be 1 to 13. 1 means ace, 2 means 2, 7 means 7, 9 means 9, 11 means jack, uh, 12 means queen and 13 means king. We're also going to have the card know what its face is. And its face means the picture file. We're going to load in a resource here. Um, and it's going to be a variable. So var face. And it's going to point to one of the picture files that we're going to put into our project folder. I'm giving you for this project all the, the pictures for all the faces and backs of all the playing cards. You'll see that in just a moment. We're also going to have the card know its back. So what texture it's going to have for the back of the playing card, that red nice back of a playing card picture that we have. So I'm going to say var back. Okay, speaking of image textures, I'm going to go ahead and save this script file, control S to save. On my desktop, I'm going to pretend that I've unzipped the file that I'm giving you a link to download in the description area below this video on YouTube. We have an assets folder, and if I open that assets folder up, you'll see that I'm giving you three subfolders, and these all have items or files in them. The cards folder is perhaps the most important. It has Picture files, PNG pictures of all the playing cards face up and three different versions, whichever one you want to use, you can use red, green, or blue. And there's a Joker card, which I don't use uh, for this project, but I thought I would include it. All of these uh, image textures are provided for free from a website called Kenny.nl. That's K-E-N-N-E-Y.nl. They are not a sponsor or they don't pay me at all to mention them. Uh, they just give away their assets usually for free or with a very permissible license. You can buy packs of resources including image textures and sound files and fonts and things like that, 3D models if you want. Uh, I really love what they do and what they give away. And when you get any resources from them, they usually or always give them away with a very permissive license. That means you can use them in projects that you publish online and you can even sell your games with their sprites or assets used. So it's amazing. That's why I can give them to you in my own download link. They appreciate you mentioning them. That's why I'm doing that right now. There is also a folder in the assets folder called fonts. I'm giving you a few fonts you can use for this project. You can also use your own, but when you make a Godot game with fonts or, or text in it, you need to include the font files in your project folder. And I'm giving you a few more pictures for the pause and play and return buttons and the start 
and uh, title screens and, and game complete screens as well. So what you should do is you should copy these three folders. Once you've unzipped them, I'm going to right click copy and I'm going to go into my memory project folder. This is our current working project folder. I'm going to make my own assets folder. I recommend you do that. So A S S E T S assets, and I'll go into that and right click and paste. When you add folders of pictures or just picture files into your project folder, and then you go back into Godot, you will see them load very quickly into your Godot project. If you don't, it means that uh, you didn't put them in your project folder or it was just so fast that you missed it. But now if I go back or down to my file system doc, you can see I have that assets folder and I can see all the cards here. And that's, that's, that's wonderful. When we make a new class of, or an instance of a class, like we make a new card in our game, when you make a new instance of a class, typically you use the keyword new. So if I save this card class file and I maybe I go to my game and uh, this is my actual game scene script and I add a new card. So I'm gonna say like uh, var c for var card is gonna be equal to card dot new. Okay, that's what typically you would do. Maybe not in this ready function. You don't have to call, copy me for this. We're not going to keep this line of code. When you make a new card, that card is only a, based on a template. And you need, need to tell that card at least two things. You need to tell it what value it has. So ace through jack, queen, and king. You need to also tell it what suit it is. So we're going to make this card accept two parameters in what's called its constructor. Its constructor... It's going to be in its own class file and it's going to accept something like this one comma two one is the suit that's the first parameter here and that would be spades we're going to use one two three and four spades hearts diamonds and clubs and the value would be two so this card would be the two of spades get it okay so when we make a new card like this we need to call a constructor that constructor in your card file is a function it needs to be named func underscore init and when you make an init uh, constructor function like this, you need to put the parameters that you want that object to require when you call that new uh, keyword, that new function call. So it's kind of weird that you use init here and new here, but that's just the way that it is. So I'm going to make two variables here. I'm going to say var s for suit. And when you make new variables for these parameters, you can just name them whatever you want, but s for suit, it makes sense to me. And var uh, v for value makes sense to me. But these are just temporary sort of function only uh, variables that only exist within the scope or within the realm of this function here, we need to save them to the whole card's main suit and value variable. So I'm going to say in this function value, this one, we want to make it equal to the value V that they just gave to us when they said new, we're going to make the suit of this whole card right here, the whole variable for the whole class, we're going to make it equal to the suit that they just passed in. We did it in the wrong order. It could be, you know, this line could be above. It doesn't really matter. We are also now going to assign the face of this card to be a specific image texture in our project folder. How do we do that? Well, I'm going to make right here the face of this card equal, and then I'm going to load. I'm going to use the load. This is really kind of core in Godot, how you load in sprites in code. You can use preload or load. We're going to use preload in a moment for the back of the card, but load lets you load in a picture. And uh, what you do, it's called a texture, really. You're going to put load and then double quotes, and then you need to put a path to a file name. So if I go and get, let's say, the card 1-1.png, and by the way, when I got these from Kenny.nl, they weren't named card-1-1. These are all my numbers, so I named all these files for the sake of this uh, project. This will help us out because we're going to get two numbers and we're going to use them in the file name. So I'm going to actually take this card 1-1, right-click and copy the path to that file, which is going to include res, colon, slash, slash, all that stuff. I'm going to paste it into here, into these double quotes right there. And I'm going to make this workspace bigger so we can see. Okay, so I have res colon slash slash assets cards card one dash one PNG. This is great. This will make this card have this this texture uh, pretty much. But the problem is these numbers are baked are baked or, or permanently in this this string of text here. That's a problem. I don't want one and one. I want the numbers that they specified when they said new. 
right? So I'm going to do what's called concatenation here. Concatenation means that you are attaching uh, different parts together. So I'm going to attach the first part of this file name together with the suit variable or the s variable. In fact, I should actually probably use the suit variable there. And I'm going to then put a dash just with text. And I'm going to put the uh, v, the value variable right there, and then a dot png at the end. So we, if we attach all these parts together, we should get a valid path to an image texture in our project folder. And so when our card loads, it'll just look and say, okay, well, it should be, you know, three, which is diamonds, and then 13, which is the king. So it'll get the picture that is the king of diamonds face, and that should work. But the way you can catenate, attach all these parts in lots of languages is you use pluses. So I'm going to put a plus there. So we attach this string to this number variable, and then I'm going to keep attaching. So I need to attach then the next part, the string, and then a tech piece of text is, is a string, then a plus, and then another plus there. And that should be almost good. The problem here in GDScript is that this is a number and this is a string and you can't attach numbers and strings nicely together. So we're going to take the numbers that they gave to us and we're going to convert them to strings. And you do that by calling the string or str method and you put the number in the round brackets of that str method. So it will, this will convert the suit into a string, which is just plain text and not a number value. I'm going to do the same thing here, str, and then in round brackets, put value. That should work. Now I've got my face texture loaded in when I create a new instance of the card class, when I give it in the new call, a uh, two, two numbers separated by a comma. Okay. What about the back of the card? Well, the back of the card is going to come from a global file. And this is pretty exciting. When you make a project in Godot, you can actually have a file, like a global file, accessible from anywhere in your game. And you can give it a name. So you can, you can just say its name to access it from anywhere in your code. And you can put like variables in this global file. And if you want to therefore create like lives in your game that you can have between different levels, this is how you would do it. Sometimes they call this a singleton in programming or in Godot. Sometimes they refer to it in Godot as auto load. It's all of those things. It's, it's, it's a global variable. So how you do this in Godot, I'm going to uh, unmaximize my workspace here. I'm going to collapse my assets folder there. To make a global code file, we're going to actually make a new code file down here first. So I'm going to right click somewhere where there's nothing. I'm going to say new script. I'm going to call it uh, game manager. And uh, right there, game manager with a col res colon slash slash and dot gd. This is where most of the logic of our game is going to be. I think I said earlier that our game is not going to be very much. In fact, it's not going to have any of the logic of our game really in it. All the logic to play our game and flip cards and time things out and reset the game and check to see if two cards are the same. That's all going to be in this game manager, but it's also going to keep track of variables like your score, your timer, your main variables, things like that. It's all going to be in here. So we're making a new GD script file. It inherits just from node. That's fine. Template, no comments. That's fine. Game manager, capital G, capital M. I'm going to press create. It's right here. I'm going to now go into my project settings. This is how you make this into a global file, uh, a singleton as they call it. Project, project settings. Up at the top, there's tabs. We're going to go to the one called auto load. And here we have very little, but we have a path little section with a folder button. I'm going to pick that code file, the game manager.gd right there. I'm going to press open and it's going to find the file name without the GD. And it's going to suggest that, that that's what I use as the name. Is that okay? Game manager with capital G, capital M. Sure. I'm going to press add. When I press add, it's going to then add that file in to be accessible from anywhere in my game as the word game manager capitalization matters to that file. It's enabled. I'm going to press close. Okay. Now that I have that, I can access my game manager from anywhere and in my game manager. I'm actually going to go ahead and double click to on the uh, GD file here to open it up. I'm going to make a variable var. I'm going to call it back. In fact, I'm going to call it card back and I'm going to make it equal to, and this is where I'm going to use the preload method and the preload method or function lets you load in an, an asset from your project folder uh, ahead of time as your game is loading, I think, before you actually need to show it in your game. 
To preload a texture file, you use preload, you put in double quotes, the name of the file or the path of the file. So I'm gonna go to my cards folder. You can decide if you want red, green, or blue, but I'm gonna use the red one. So right click on the red one and say copy path. I'm gonna click in my double quotes and paste. So uh, that's what I have. So I have this card back reference in my game manager and I'm doing this in case I wanna make a feature in my game later on. I'm not gonna make it in this version of the game where I can choose, let the user choose what color, what theme of cards that they use. So if I want the user to be able to pick what color for the backs of the cards they have, uh, I've seen that feature in like Solitaire that Microsoft makes. You can choose with the picture on the back of the card. You could do that in your game manager. You can make a part of that code and not have that code be a part of your actual playing card, okay? So now our playing card needs to go to the game manager and find out what its back should look like, which is gonna be this card back file. So I'm gonna save this script file, uh, control S. I'm gonna go to my card file and I'm gonna make right when this card first loads, I'm going to say the back of this card, we're in the card.gd script file here, is going to be equal to, and then I can type game manager dot, and now I have access to anything in the game manager, any variables, any functions, they're all here. If I type uh, card back, it actually knows that it's there, it finishes it for me, I can press enter, there we go, okay, that should work. Now, our card is kind of almost complete, isn't it? But if I save the card and I go back to my game, in fact, I'm gonna go to my 2D workspace and I'll unmaximize my workspace. There we go. If I press play scene now, this is how you play this scene, you don't get anything. You get just what you see in the editor. You have your, your background, it has a grid. There's nothing in the grid, there are no cards. So how do you actually make cards? Well, we're, when we make a new instance of a card, we're gonna say card.new and we're gonna have to add that card as a child of this grid node in our game. But we are gonna do that from the game manager and we're gonna make separate functions for everything in our game. Every little task is gonna be its own little mini program called a function. And uh, I just wanna show you what it would look like though and we have to deal with a few more things to do with the card because the card isn't gonna quite fit properly. So just in my game, just for now, just for, for practice, we're gonna make uh, a new card, that's what we just did here, card.new12, this is gonna be the two of spades, maybe I'll change this to uh, four, which would be the two of clubs, maybe I'll say 12, which is the queen of clubs, and I'm gonna add this card, if I save it right now, if I press play scene, it doesn't show up, because we have to actually add it into our node tree here as a child of the grid. So what I can do here is I can say, um, dollar sign, which is how we get the nodes in our in our scene or children nodes at least. I'm gonna say dollar sign grid that gets this grid node. And I can say dot add underscore child. We're gonna add a child node to the grid. And I'm gonna say, we're gonna add C, this card that we just made to that grid. And when I do that, I'll save it, control S. I'll play the scene. Is it gonna show up? Why not? Well, we actually forgot to do one thing, or I forgot to do one thing. In my card, I made variables, and I have a value for the card, I have a suit for the card, I have a face for the card, and a back for the card. Those back and face both point to textures, but a texture button, which is what this card node is, uh, or card class is based on, you need to actually set the texture of the texture button. And just because you have some in variable, it doesn't mean it actually is gonna show up on the, on the texture button itself. So right when the card first loads into the game, I'm gonna say set underscore normal underscore texture. This is a method that's, or a function that's built into all texture buttons. And when you set a normal texture, basically you have to say what texture you're gonna put on the card or on the, uh, on the button right in those round brackets. In this case, I'm gonna put the face of the card. I'm gonna make these cards all face up to start. We'll change that later. So now it should work theoretically. I'll do a quick control S and I'll count my lucky stars if it works. I'm gonna shrink the, uh, the, the workspace back to its uh, default size and I'll press play scene. I'm still on my game. Let's press play scene. And there we go. I've got my queen of clubs because in my game's script, I when it first loaded, Again, we're not gonna keep this code around. We made a suit for 12 value card. If I say um, 11 and three, that would be the Jack of Diamonds. So if I press uh, play scene, there we go, Jack of Diamonds. And of course I could do more of these. I could copy and paste the, this. I could make 
a uh, var d and I could, in fact, I don't even have to make a variable. I could just say add a child and I'll copy and I'll paste that right in there and I'll get rid of that line. I could say, you know, uh, one and five, that would be the five of spades and it would just add it after it made it right all in one line. So if I press play, there we go. Now, I don't want to do this 52 times, so we're about to set this up, but just so you know, it works. The problem is that they are not going to be all the right size, and we'll fix that in a moment, but let's go ahead and dive into making uh, an array and making a whole deck in an array. So I'm going to get rid of these lines of code. In fact, I'm just going to select them and press Control K. Control K will put a hashtag at the beginning of those lines that you've selected that comments them out. You can also select lines and do a Control K again to uncomment. So same thing, control K, control K. I will control K to, to comment those lines out. And when you have nothing in a function, you need a pass line indented, of course. So our game manager needs to have all the logic of our game built into it. I'm going to, in my game manager though, need to know where my game scene is. So right now my game manager, if I make everything a little bit smaller at the side so we can see more of it, it has a variable called cardback. But more important than that, much more important, is it needs to know where our game is, where the game scene is. We're going to make a variable called game, and we're going to set it to equal get underscore node. This is going to get the node of our, of our main scene. And we have to write exactly this, forward slash root, forward slash game, forward slash, I believe. This code here basically gives our game manager a pointer it doesn't actually make a whole new game in the game manager. It basically just points this variable to be able to access our currently loaded game scene. I'm not entirely sure of the logic of this and really it's hard for me to explain what this root means, but this basically means the root of your active game and you have a scene called game with a capital G loaded into it. Again, I'm not really too sure on what's really going on here, but I know that it works. Something that you should understand as a concept is that, and we're going to be seeing this throughout this project, is sometimes variables can directly hold a value, sort of. Like if you make a variable called a var maybe x, and you made x equal to 6. Well, later on in your program, you could say, you know, make y equal to x plus 4. And y would have a value of 10 because six plus four is 10, and you said make y equal to x plus four. Well, sometimes these values are really just stored in this variable, but this variable is really just pointing to this value, which is in your computer's memory. Sometimes though, variables don't directly sort of hold values like this. Sometimes they're just pointers, and when you make a pointer to another variable from a, another variable like we are right now, kind of, we're making a variable that points to a scene, it doesn't mean that variable gets a whole new copy of it, it just means it points to the same place in memory. Hopefully that kind of makes sense. We're going to see the difference between uh, that or instances where we're using pointers more in this project. We don't need a var x for this project, okay? What we do need though is we do need to make a deck and a deck of cards rather. And a deck of cards is really a pointer to a bunch of different cards that you've made in memory. In order to have a bunch of variables, each one being a separate card, be stored in one variable called a deck, we need to make what's called an array. And an array, well, I'm gonna actually sneak a little bit of Blender into this video. So here's Blender, the 3D animation, 3D modeling software I also teach on this channel. Um, sometimes I describe to new programmers that an, a variable is basically a box that you can put a value into, like a number or a string, which is a word, or maybe a card class in this case. And when you make a variable, it basically, like a box, stores that information. And if it's like a cardboard box, you can write a name on it, like X, and then you can later on in your program refer to X and it'll really access what's in that box. So the number maybe six, if we're going back to my previous example. So a variable basically stores one piece of data or a class instance, if you're talking about a card. But an array is really like a row of cubby holes. And in Blender, uh, you can make a row of cubby holes using what's called the array modifier, which is coincidence because that's the, the programming term as well. If I enable this array modifier, you can see what it does. It makes a row of boxes 
that each can hold its own value. And this is the same concept as an array in programming. So if you make an array, it is really one thing. You can give it a name like deck for deck of playing cards, but in each cubby hole, you can give it a different value. They all have to be the same kind of a thing. You can't put like a number in one, a card in another, um, a string in another, a vector two in another. They all have to be the same kind of thing. So card, card, card. And how do you access therefore each individual one? So I wanna say like, you know, this one, if it's all deck, what I can do and what arrays do is they number each one. So you can say deck, access deck zero, because you start counting from zero in computers most often. So deck zero, deck one, deck two, all the way up to if you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight cards in this deck. So deck zero to deck seven would be eight spots. It's important to know that you start counting at zero and your, your last one is one less than the number total in the whole length of the whole thing. And in GD script and many languages, you can make arrays as long as you want, right? Or as short as you want. In this case, we're gonna make an array and then we're gonna add in using a loop. That means the repeating repetitive piece of code that makes a new card in spot one, makes a new card or adds a new card, adds a new card 52 times. And each time we're gonna use a little bit of math to increment the numbers up appropriately. But with a deck of playing cards, the first 13 cubby holes or cards are going to be suit one, and then we're gonna to have to make, you know, suit two, and then cards ace through king, and then ace through king, four times. So 13 times four cards in an array. In GD script, we're gonna make an array in our game manager. We're gonna call it var deck. And the way you make deck, this variable, an array, is you say equals array with a capital A, and then round brackets. Okay, I'm not sure why you don't use dot new. This is a special kind of a thing in GD script, okay? It's not quite a class. It's, I think, at least it's set up a little bit differently, okay? This array has absolutely no cubby holes or no spots yet. So what we can do is we can use a function that we're gonna write to loop through and create a bunch of cards. Now, that's the next new thing, loops. But let's go ahead first and make a couple of functions. We're gonna make a function here. We have to make sure we're outdented called fill deck. Okay, and that's going to be a function. We're going to put round brackets and a colon, and I'll press enter and write pass. We're going to write another function called func deal deck and put our round brackets and our colon and a pass. So when you make functions in Godot, they don't run right away unless they're the init function in a, in a class, which this is not, or they're not the ready or the, uh, the game loop function, which we're actually not going to use, I don't think, in, the, in this project. This ready function loads right when the game first loads uh, or this game manager file first loads. But these functions, fill deck and deal deck do not. We wanna order them or run them in this order, fill deck and deal deck. So in the ready function here, I'm gonna call them in that order. And therefore, because ready loads and runs right when you first launch your game, it'll run these two methods. So deal deck and then, well, pardon me, fill deck is gonna be first and then deal deck in that order. Fill deck needs to make a bunch of cards and put them in the in in the array deck. Uh, so we're going to say uh, deck, and then I'm going to use square brackets. And I'm going to say deck uh, spot. Ooh, we actually need to make. Uh, we actually could say deck zero, and we, we could make deck equal deck zero. This is the first spot in the cubby holes. We could make it equal to a new card. But the problem is deck doesn't even have a spot zero yet, I don't believe. We're gonna use a method or a function that's built into an array called append. So I can say here deck.append. And this append is a method so or a function, so I can need to put round brackets here. And I can say uh, card.new. And I'm gonna put round brackets here, and I need to put maybe one comma one for the one or ace of spades. Now that I have that, I can do in the, uh, I can add into the deal deck method. I could say something like uh, deck spot zero because we have one item in the deck and the first item is, is number zero. And we're gonna add that, pardon me, to our game. And our game is up here pointed to using this game variable. So I could say game dot, and I'm gonna get the grid in my game. So I'm gonna say get node. This is how you can get a node that's a child node of the game. You can say get node uh, grid, that's in my other scene, in my uh, game scene, I have grid here. And I can say dot add underscore child. And I could say add deck zero. And uh, that might work. I'm gonna do a quick control S. 
oh, you know what? We forgot, or I forgot to add one little keyword into our program. When we load the game into our game manager or a pointer to our actual game scene in our game manager, this game manager might load slightly before our game scene loads. And if that happens, if the game manager loads first, whoops, if the game manager loads first, it might not see where what this game scene is because maybe it hasn't loaded yet. So it can't make this pointer to something that hasn't loaded yet. So what I can do here is I can use the keyword on ready first. And what that does is it makes sure that it will only assign this game variable to what it's supposed to be pointed to once that thing that it's pointing to has actually been loaded into the game. This on ready makes that actually work properly. So that's what it was saying. It was error use on ready. So I'm going to press stop. I'm going to press play scene. And now I have the ace of spades and I've loaded one card into my game and I've successfully used the, and I'll make this a bit smaller. I have called the fill deck function right here and it's made a new card. It's added it to the deck. And now I've taken that deck in spot one and I've loaded it and I've dealt it out. I've added it to my actual game as a child of the grid node. So it's, it's in the grid. The problem here is that we need to loop and a loop in, in programming basically will do whatever you put in that loop again and again and again. And if you have an infinite loop, it'll run it forever, but we don't want that. We want to run a loop basically enough times to run the lines of code that you need to add 52 cards of four different suits of 13 values each into that deck array. And then in our deal deck, a function we need to deal out or make a loop that runs 52 times. It puts each next value or, or cubby hole value from the deck array into that grid as a child of the grid in our game. So to do this, what is a loop and what does a loop look like? Well, there are different kinds of loops. The most efficient loop would use the word for in this case, I'm not going to show you that because that's a bit more uh, or less easy to understand. I think the there's a loop called a while loop, and I think it is easier to understand. So let's just talk about this for a second. I'm going to comment out this line of code here, and uh, I'm going to comment out this line of code because we're actually not going to use those. And I'm going to put a pass here uh, just to show you what a loop does. If I use the word while and I say while true, this is going to be an infinite loop. When you use the word while, it needs a condition after it. And whatever code you therefore put uh, after or inside of that loop would be indented under that while true line will run the number of times that this condition allows. And so basically, if you say while true, you're basically letting it say, hey, while this thing is true and look, it's always going to be true. So it's going to run this loop forever. What do you put in this loop? Well, you can put anything and you can put multiple lines of code. I'm just going to do a quick print here. I'm going to print the line of code out to the output uh, panel console down here. I'm going to say spaghetti. Okay. If I tried to run this, it would maybe not even run. Will it run? No, Godot is not going to be happy with me because I have an infinite loop. And those are generally bad unless they're a game loop. The way I can make a loop more functional and really work is by giving it a limiter. And by a limiter, I mean we can increment and count through a value and we can set an actual condition here for how long the loop is allowed to go through and repeat itself. So what does that look like? Well, if I make a, a variable, let's say I make a var i, i means stands for iterator and I make it equal to, to zero. And maybe my, every time I loop, I'm going to make i equal to itself plus one. This is a kind of a funny way of making a variable add one to itself in one line of code. So you're making i this variable memory equal to whatever value it already has plus one. And so it adds what it already is to one, and then it stores that back into itself. So this is kind of a way of just saying, hey, add one to i. If we are looping and every time we are, we, we're going to add one to a, a counting variable, I could make a condition for this loop, something like while i is less than 10. And what this will do is it checks this condition and it'll only do what's in the loop again or, or at all if this condition is true. If i is zero at the beginning, it checks to see is zero less than 10? That, that is true, zero is less than 10. So it'll print spaghetti, but then it makes i equal to itself plus one. So it'll make i zero plus one, which is one. So it'll make i now one. And then it'll loop again, because that's what it does. But it'll only really do what's in the loop if 
this condition is true. Is one now less than 10? Yes, it is. So it would print spaghetti, spaghetti, spaghetti 10 times probably until it made i equal to, maybe it was nine, and then it makes it equal to 10. Is 10 less than 10? No, that is not true. 10 is not less than 10, so it would not print spaghetti anymore. And then it would continue on with the rest of my code if I had more, more code in that function. So if I pl press play scene now, it printed, you can see at the bottom here, spaghetti, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times. So that's that's the loop. You should try that for yourself if you're new to programming and haven't seen loops before. With a for loop, this is going to be more efficient. I'm not going to show you that in this video. Maybe you can look at that for yourself. You don't have to create a separate variable. A for loop will automatically let you create a variable in one line and it'll increment it automatically without you having to put that one line in there. Uh, so maybe check that out. But in this video, I'm just going to use a while loop. In this case, I'm going to add. So I'm going to get deck and I'm going to use the append method. And I'm going to say uh, card dot new. And I'm going to say, well, we're going to add a card uh, 13 with the spade value. Now I could use hard coded numbers here. Like I could say one comma, and then I could even use that I value here. So I could say, you know, one comma zero, even though that doesn't really count for our cards. So instead of using I here and the I is our number, I'm going to make two numbers. I'm going to make a variable called S for the suit and I'm going to make it equal to one. And I'm going to make a variable called V for the value. And I'm going to make it equal to one as well. Now for this loop, we're going to just do one loop for all the spades in our deck. So one to 13 of the spades. So I'm going to say while the value is less than 14 because we want to count one to 13 and we want to actually use 13 as well. So we're going to, we'll do one higher than that for 14. We're going to add a card to the deck. It's going to be using the suit number here, which is one, and it's going to be using the value here. So every time this loop runs, we need to then count up the value by one. So let's think about how this code will run. If we, when we run this fill deck function, we make a variable called S and V, they're both one. And then we have a loop that says while V is less than 14, do this. Is the value less than 14? Yes, it is. It's one. So I need to then, uh, it'll make a new card and add it to the deck and it'll be of suit one of value one. And then it'll add one to that value and then it'll loop again. So then you'll get suit one value two. It'll add one to it, suit one value three, suit one value four, all the way up to 13. And once it hits 14 here and it tries to loop again, it won't because 14 is not less than 14. Now that I have that, I have 14 cards in my deck and that's a good place to stop and see if we can actually make it deal those 14 cards. So I'm going to go down to my deal deck section and I'm going to make a uh, variable called C and I'm going to make it equal to, I have too many spaces there. I'm going to make it equal to one and I'm going to do a while loop and I'm going to say while C is less than, and here I can say either 14 or I can say, yeah, you know what? I'll do 14 here and uh, we'll, we'll keep it kind of simple here. And I can say uh, game dot get child or get node, pardon me. We're going to get the node called grid of the game. And I'm going to say add child. And we're going to say uh, deck spot. And here I should actually use deck spot zero to uh, 12. So we'll make it less than 13, pardon me. So I'm gonna say, get the card zero and then card one, then card two. Remember the array start counting from zero and not from one. So if I do a quick control S, if you need to pause the video, please do. I'm going to now play my game. I'm in the game scene. I'll press play scene. And it looks like it's not going to work. You know why it's not working? Because I forgot to, do you see my error? I forgot to count up C every time. So it's going to keep looping forever because C is never, it's always going to be at zero. So I need to say C plus equals one. And the plus equals is just a shorter way of saying make it equal to itself plus one. So I could say C equals C plus one. Some of you might be wondering, can I use C plus plus? Plus plus in some languages adds one. No, you can't. It's plus equals or the long way. But unfortunately, Godot does not allow plus plus. If I press play scene now, 
Aha, I got all my cards and yeah, they're all there. They are too big. We'll sort that out in just a moment. But along this theme, can we get all the cards and not just the spades? Well, in order to, to loop through 13 uh, different values four times, we actually need to use a loop within a loop. So this while loop is for the values. I'm going to then make that whole loop run four times. I'm going to put that while loop inside of a while uh, loop that's going to check for the suit and while the suit is less than five. And so I'm going to finish that conditional loop and I'm going to indent this while to be inside of this loop. And every time the outer loop runs, I need to make sure that the value gets reset to one because otherwise the value will just get to 14. And then when the outer loop runs again, it'll just keep going from 15. So this, this line is necessary. When we do this outer loop, we're going to say while s is less than 5. s is 1, so s is less than 5. That's great. I'm going to make the v equal to 1, which is, which is great. It already is, at least the first time. It's going to go through and repeat these two lines 13 times. And then it's going to go back up to the top loop. And it's going to move on to the next suit, hopefully. And then it's going to reset v to 1 and make 13 more cards. The last line in this loop needs to be make s equal to itself plus one. So add one to the suit every time. This is a little bit tricky logically, especially if you're new to programming. If it's not, it'll be old hat to you, but a loop in a loop is a good way of running through basically uh, a 2D array or basically what we have here. Okay, I think that should work. The problem is now we need to add more than just 13 children. I'm going to say, instead of saying 13, I'm going to say deck dot uh, size. Uh, an array has a size method built in or a function built in that lets you get its size. Hopefully that's the right number. Let's go ahead and try this out. Do we have everything we need? Yes, we do. It works great. The problem here is that the cards when I run are too big. And uh, that's because of the size of the pictures that I've given you. I didn't know how big we were going to make this game. And this is the size that Kenny.nl gave us. So I'm going to go back to our card. But if you need to pause the video and get this code, you can uh, pause the video here on my fill deck and deal deck functions. And then I'm going to go up to the top of this game manager code. And you can pause the video now if you need to. And on my game, I've got very little. In fact, I've got nothing. I can get rid of this commented code because we don't need it anymore. And on my card, I have just this code that you see on the screen right now. Okay. What is next? Well, as you saw, the cards are not the right size. And so what I'm going to do is show you a little bit of what's in the properties of my card. And uh, really that means what's a property or what properties are available for texture buttons like our card. So if I go to the 2D view of my workspace and I go and I select my grid of my game scene and I press the plus button with my grid selected, I can actually search for card in my new nodes. And because my card is a class, it'll actually show up in this list because I use that class name keyword in that card file. So I can actually add a card just by double clicking to my grid. And you can see the card doesn't show anything because we didn't call a constructor on it. We didn't give it a number and a number. But what I can do is I can open up, I can select it and on look on the side, look at all the properties our card has. And if I go into its texture button texture section, you can see that we can set its normal texture here. Uh, so I can drag in maybe the ace of spades picture file right there. And that's what we basically did by calling that uh, set normal texture function call right there. We basically just used that, that normal textures slot right there over in the inspector. But you can see that this card is too big. And the way we would change it over here, the, we would have to do a few things. We would have to change uh, its expand ability to be on so we can stretch it out. But that just makes it shrink to nothing. If I hover over that, it gives me an explanation of what that, what that is. You can read that for yourself. We can change the stretch mode so that you can't stretch the card to be distorted. So I might want to select keep aspect uh, centered. And so now if the card stretches out in the grid to be bigger, um, it won't scale the picture to be stretched. It'll, it'll keep the aspect ratio uh, of that picture and keep it centered in that area, depending on how, what shape that area gets. But more importantly, in these control nodes, there is a section called size flags. And it takes a little bit of time to figure out what these actually do. But what these do 
for both horizontal and vertical directions, left and right and up and down, you can check or uncheck these boxes to make it so that the child node of a container, like the grid, will expand out to fill its column and its little section of that container. If you don't have expand turned on or one of these other options, fill is okay. Uh, to be honest, I'm not really too confident about what all these options are, really what fill does versus expand. But I do know that in this case, we need to check both fill and expand for both. And look what happened. This grid only has one column, even though it's way too high uh, for one card or tall for one card, but it is now maintaining the size of that card. So if I have, uh, or the picture, the aspect ratio, it's not stretching it out. If I have four rows here, this box of that button will be bigger maybe by a little bit but at least the texture the picture will be not stretched and it'll be centered and it'll fill up that area so now we could add more cards as long as we check these boxes how do we do all this with code well there are ways we can we can call methods for these and it's actually not more than in about four lines of code so let's go ahead and set this up i'm going to get rid of this card i'll delete it we don't need to add one in there really uh, until we do it in code. And I'm gonna go, I'll, I'll quickly save that scene. I'll go back to my script workspace. In my cards ready function, I'm going to write four lines of code. I'm gonna call a method that's built into um, all texture buttons or all control nodes, I'm not sure, um, called set, I think it's all control nodes, set size flags. And that's those four little check boxes for uh, vertical and horizontal. We need to actually use the set uh, underscore H, that's lowercase h, size flags. Those are those little four checkbox that said expand and fill, and then there were two other options. We have the first two options selected, and those options all have numbers assigned to them, and we need to pass that number or those numbers in here. Now, the funny thing is option one, which was, I believe, fill or expand, and the second option was fill or expand, those are the two. Those are option one and option two. But if we wanna select both of them, we just add those numbers together. So I'm gonna put three here, okay? How do I know this? Lots of little investigation, okay? That's how I figured these things out. I'm gonna copy and paste that because we're gonna do that for the vertical flags as well. We're gonna have the same setting for both. We're also then going to need to change that expand property and that is accessed using a function called set underscore expand. And of course it needs round brackets and we're gonna make that true. The last line of code we need in this ready function is that stretching mode that we selected uh, to be, you know, keep aspect but centered. That is a method or function called set underscore stretch underscore mode and then in round brackets because we're calling a, a method or function here i'm going to say texture button dot and now we get a bunch of kind of names for presets these are actually numbers and they are constants that means you can't change them in code ever that you just have access to them these are actually enums and enums are a way you can assign a number to a word so these actually all have names but they really are numbers and you can just access the numbers by typing in the name. We're going to say texture button dot, actually, you know what? These aren't even the right ones. Texture button dot stretch. There we go. They were more in that list than I thought. Uh, stretch, and we're gonna say stretch keep aspect centered. I'm gonna use my arrow key down to go down and then press enter when I've selected the third one there. Stretch keep aspect centered. And I'm gonna make this workspace maximize so you can see what that all is. With these four lines, our card will be set up correctly. It'll shrink to fit the grid when more or all the cards are added. It will expand the way it should and it'll be centered, it'll, or it'll center that uh, texture in the middle of the card button, okay? So I'll do a quick control S to save. If you wanna pause the video, please do. I'll stop my game, I'll press play scene. It will now shrink all the cards to fit nicely. The problem is, is that the cards, when you click on them, they don't flip. And in fact, they are flipped the wrong way. They should be loaded with their back facing us. So let's go ahead and go to our card class and I'll make this output uh, section uh, smaller. We set right when we first made a card to make its normal texture, the face of the card right in this line. We're gonna make it equal to the back of the card instead. So just with that one little change, if I save and load my uh, scene, I now have the back of the cards. How do we make it so that when you actually click on the cards, 
they flip over. Well, they are buttons and they have a built in function called underscore pressed. You might be thinking to yourself, if you're familiar with Blender, that we would use a signal here and we definitely could, although I've discovered with buttons, especially texture buttons, you can use a function or you can implement a function called function underscore pressed. And if you do that, this will run whenever you click the card and there's no need to set up a, a signal. I'm not sure why. Maybe somebody can tell me in the comments area below. But if I press the card, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run a function called flip. And the reason why we're doing this separately and not just putting the actual logic of turning the cards over and swapping the textures is because we're actually going to put a delay on this if we want to turn the cards back over later. So I'm going to make another function here called flip. And again, this will come in handy later. And this flip function, I'm going to actually write it here, function flip, is actually going to look and see what the current texture on the card is. And if it's one, it's going to change it to the other. And if it's the other, it's going to change it to the, the first one. <laughs> if it's facing up, it's going to face turn it face down. If it's facing down, it's going to turn it face up. So here I'm going to say if get normal texture if that is equal to equals equals together back then i want to change it to set normal texture and i'm going to set it to face you see the logic here it's pretty elementary i'm going to make an else if we have an if statement it checks the condition there's only two possibilities here so i can just use the else keyword here and it'll just do the the opposite this means otherwise basically in code. I'm going to say set normal texture. I'll be lazy and copy and paste that right there. And I'll change it to back. Okay. If I save control S, let's go and see if that works. Hopefully this pressed function works. We don't need to add a, a, a signal and it'll call this function. And it'll check the logic of it. So if I press play scene, I've got my game scene active. If I click on a card, aha, it flips over. And if I click on it again, hey, it flips back over because I can flip in either direction because of those if and else. And I can flip as many cards as I want. I don't want that, of course. I only want to be able to click two cards. And the game manager is going to have to look at those two cards and see, are they both sevens or do they both have the same value? And if they have the same value, we're going to do one thing. We're going to make them fade out. And if they don't, we're going to flip them back over. That's why we have this flip function separate so that the game manager can call this and not have to rely on us pressing the card to flip the card over. Okay, this flip is a separate thing that could happen in more than one way. And if we separate this function out into its own little function, we can use it in multiple ways, which makes it reusable, which is wonderful. It's a, it's a principle in good uh, software engineering or programming. So how do I make the game manager look at two cards? Well, I'm gonna go back to my game manager and I'm gonna go up to the top of the game manager and I'm gonna make two cards. And these are gonna be pointers. They're gonna be variables, but really they're gonna be just looking and storing pointers at cards that we've clicked on. So I'm gonna say var card one, and guess what? Var card two. And those are not gonna have any value. And because they don't have any value by default when you don't assign anything like that, they are null. They have no information. They don't have any me memory associated with them they are called null. So we're going to write a function called choose card. And we are going to check to see if card one is null. If it is, we're going to make the first card they pick uh, pointed to by this variable. And this variable will, will look at that first card. If card one is has been chosen, it'll check to see if card two has been chosen yet. If it hasn't, well, it'll make the card they click on card two. And then no more cards can be clicked on because you only want the user to be able to click on two cards in one go. And then the game should like stop any other card clicks. It wouldn't accept anymore. So we've got two, these two variables, card one and card two. I need a function here, a func. I'll make that uh, visible for you. I'm going to call it choose card. Uh, when you say choose card, it is a function call. I'm going to put a pass in the, in the next line. You're going to send it a pointer to a card. So I'm going to say var c here. Now, how do you send a variable, a card, or a pointer to a card? Well, there is a keyword, and that keyword is self. And what we can do here is from the card, when you press the card, 
we're actually not going to flip the card directly because that would let every card be flipped and unlimited number of cards be able to flip themselves. We don't want the card to flip itself. We want the game manager to flip the card for us if that card is accessible, if we've only selected less than two cards. Uh, so we're in, when we press the card, we're actually going to run that game manager dot choose card function and we're going to send the choose card self and because we are sending this self value from the card class itself we are sending this choose card method a pointer to the card the specific card that you clicked on so it is a, getting a pointer this choose card method in the game manager that is handy because i'll go back now to my game manager my game manager, this choose card function, now has a pointer to the card in variable C. And now I can check to see if, and I'll put a few extra spaces down here, enter, enter, so that you can see the code centered. I'm going to see if card one, is card one empty or has a card already been selected? Well, I'm going to say if card one is equal to null, that means it's free. And that means that no cards have been chosen because it would be card one and card two chosen in that order. So if card one is equal to null, I'm going to make card one equal to the card that they just clicked on, card C. Otherwise, I'm going to, uh, if card two isn't chosen, I'm going to assign it to C, but only if it's not chosen. Now, if I want to have two ifs in a row, but have them check one after the other and only check the second one if the first one isn't checked, I need to use else if or elif for short. In GDScript, it's elif. In some other languages, you might get else space if GDScript programmers are lazy like this. So elif card uh, two is equal to null. I'm going to make, oops, I need my colon there. We're going to make card two equal to, pardon me, C. Okay. But in either of these cases, if we do successfully have a card that's not assigned card one or card two, and we make the card they clicked on one of those cards, we wanna flip that card over. So for each of these, I'm gonna say, make that card that we just got a pointer to flip itself over. So I'm gonna say card one dot flip here, and then right down here, card two dot flip. The other thing we have to take into account is the user might click on the same card twice, either by accident or, or trying to mess the program up. So as soon as a card has been clicked on and it flips over, we should then disable it as a button. And that means the user can't click on it anymore. So what I'm going to do is right before it flips over, or maybe right after it flips over, depending on what you want to do, um, I'm going to say card one dot set underscore disabled. Now, this is a little bit of a negatively referring uh, method call here or function call here. Set disabled is a little bit of a weird name. You would think it would be set enabled and then you would give it true or false as a parameter. If you are setting it to be disabled, if you say true, you are disabling that card. It's kind of a weird thing. Usually you would say like set enabled and have it true or false. So I'm gonna say we're gonna disable card one if it, uh, if it becomes card one and I'm gonna copy and paste down here, but we have to make sure it's card two for this one. We're gonna disable it. So let's go ahead and do a quick control S to save. I'm gonna press play scene. And now I can click on a card, it flips over. Can I click on the same card again? No, I can't, but I can click on another card. And those two are not a match. And if they are not a match, well, I should flip them over. And so we're gonna write a function for that. We also have to check though, if they are a match, we're gonna leave them face up, but we're gonna fade them out and we're going to reset card one and card two, the pointers back to null so we can check more cards right after that. So we're going to write a function called check cards. You see how we're breaking our whole program down into little bite size functions. This is a good practice in programming. So I'm gonna write another function here called func. This is in my game manager called check uh, check cards. And that does not need any parameters because this code file, it actually has card one and card two built in. And this method or function will get called. I'll give it a pass for now. Um, it's going to get called if card two has been filled or pointed to, uh, or points to a card, because if card one is pointing to a card, there might not still be a second card selected or clicked on. So once there is two cards clicked on, we need to actually call check cards. 
Okay, hopefully that makes sense. You wouldn't call this after just one card is, is checked or clicked on. You have to click it once the second card only has been clicked on. Okay, what does check cards do? Well, it's going to look and peek inside of card one and card two and look at its value. So I'm going to write an if statement here and I'm going to say if card one dot, and this is how you can access anything in that card dot value is equal to card two dot value, what do we do? Well, that means if the card one value matches the card two value, if they're both sevens, well, then they match and, and that's a pair. What do we do then? Well, we're going to fade the cards out, both of them, which means that we're changing their color and their opacity or transparency. And we're going to make card one and card two reset back to null so more cards can be clicked on. So I'm going to say here, if card one's value matches card two's value, I'm going to say get card one uh, dot and all things that you can show on the screen, especially user interface nodes like texture buttons, they have a property called set underscore modulate. And when you call this function, you put in round brackets a color that you want to alter the normal color of the, of the image texture by. So you actually need to make a new color here and you can just call the color uh, method to do that. This is like a constructor. You don't have to type dot new for some reason. I'm not exactly sure why that is underneath the hood of GDScript. But if you run this color method or you make a new color, you can put in these round brackets four decimal numbers. These decimal numbers correspond with red, green, and blue values. And those numbers have to be between zero and one, like 0 0.5. And the last of the four numbers that you put is the alpha value, which is how transparent that color is. So if I say 0 0.6 comma 0 0.6, comma 0 0.6, I'm going to be making this color, whatever the color of the card is, a little more gray. Okay, that's what kind of what I want. And I'm going to put a fourth value here, I'm going to say 0 0.5. And that's for the alpha value, it'll make the card half transparent, which is kind of what I want. So I'm going to do this for both cards, I'll copy and paste card one and card two, and I'll change that to card two. I also need to make sure then that I take card one and card two, the pointers in the game manager, card one and card two, and set them back to null so two more cards can be chosen. So I'm going to say card one equals null and card two equals null. Okay, these four lines is what happens if the cards do match. If the cards don't match, I'm going to write an else, I believe, and it needs a colon, of course, and I'll press enter and it'll be indented in. I need to flip those cards back over. So I'm going to say card one dot flip, and we're going to cause that card to flip over. Same thing, card two dot flip. And those two cards have been disabled because they were chosen. We're going to re-enable them, but we can only do that before they have uh, been set back to null. So we're going to use these same two lines of code, card one equals null, card two equals null, but those have to be after we re-enable those cards. In fact, I'm just going to copy this line of code here and paste it right here and use card one. I'll copy and paste and card two. And I'm gonna set their disabled property to false that will re-enable that card. It's a little bit of a backwards double negative thing. There, set disabled false means that we are enabling the card for both one and two. So if the, we check the cards and they are the same, we modulate them to be gray and transparent or darker and transparent, and uh, the card pointers will be set to null so we can click more cards. And we, or otherwise, if the cards don't match, we are going to flip them over and we are going to set them as uh, flip them back over to face down, make sure they are enabled again and make the pointers back to null so we can select more cards. Hopefully that makes sense. I'm going to let you uh, pause the video if you need to, but I'll do a quick control S. I'll press uh, play scene. And so now if I play my game, I can click on a card. It's an eight. If I click on another card, it was not an eight and it flipped them back over. That happened too fast. That was way too quick. I couldn't see what the other card was. And part of memory is being able to see the cards, know where they are, and hopefully recall them or remember where they were. That's why it's called memory before you flip them back over so you can remember them later. My cards right now are not shuffled. And we'll tackle that the first thing in the next part of this uh, two part mini series. But look, all the cards line up. So you've got aces here, twos, all the way through jacks, queens, and kings. There's no shuffling here. So look, I found two cards and they faded out really instantly. And that probably happened too quick. So we need a delay here. If I click on these two here, there we go, they faded out. 
and I can access more. So the game is working pretty well. I just need a delay. And to make a delay in Godot, I need to use what's called a timer. And so in my game manager, I'm actually not going to make a timer um, using Godot's interface. If you're familiar with Godot, you might know that, you know, if you're in a scene, you can go to uh, your node scene tree and you can press plus and you can search for timer. And a timer is the way that you can count down. And when it counts down to zero, you can uh, run code. You can call a function to run. You can also make timers only run once, so they'll count down and then stop, but then call a function or method when they when they run out. Or you can make timers repeating again and again, so you can run like a, a, a stopwatch or a clicker that will click every second or any increment that you really want. We're not going to use it this way. We're not going to add one using Godot's interface. We're going to make timers programmatically uh, and in the background of our game as a child of our game manager. So what does this actually look like? Well, in my script workspace, I'm going to make this bigger again. I'm going to go to my game manager. We're going to make a few timers. We're going to make a timer or two of them up at the top, at least for now. We're actually going to have three for our game, one for the seconds clock for our game. But I'm going to make a variable called uh, match timer. And I'm going to make that equal to a timer dot new. And I'm going to make another variable called flip timer. And I'm going to make it equal to a timer dot new. But in order for a timer to work, you need to connect it. In other words, it's its signal, which is going to be a timeout signal when the timer runs out to a function that you will call when that timer runs out. You also need to add the timer to your game. And this is the game manager. Even though it's not really part of the active scene, we can still add it as a child of this game manager node. Um, and that's a little bit funny. I'm not quite sure why that is, but we can. And so we're going to create a function that will actually set these timers up right when the game first starts. So when I have my game first load and it loads this this auto loaded scene this game manager it calls this ready function this ready function is going to call a function called setup timers and we're about to make this setup timers and it'll set up all two we're going to add another one in the next part of this this two part mini series so setup timers let's go ahead and make that i'm going to make that on the next line funk setup timers and hopefully that uh, red line will will go away. I'll write a pass there and just click and wait for a second. There we go. That red line went away. This setup timers function needs to connect each of these timers to a, a method that we are or a function that we're going to write. So I'm going to do a flip timer first. I'm going to say uh, flip timer dot connect. And this connect uh, keyword is a function call. And you need to give this function three parameters. You need to tell it what uh, signal that timers know about or, or a signal on the timer is going to trigger the calling of another function. So I'm going to write in here, we're going to use the timeout signal for a timer. And that means when the timer runs out, essentially. And you put this in double quotes. I'm going to put a comma. And the next thing we need to put, the next parameter, is what file are you pointing to where you're going to run a function when the timer times out? We're going to put self, and that just means we're going to run a, some code on this file itself. Next, we're going to name the function that we're going to run. And we haven't actually made that function yet, but I'm going to call it, I'm going to give it a nice long but good name. I'm going to call it match cards and score. And uh, when I make it, it will have round brackets and it will have the funk keyword in front of it, but you don't need to put those things when you actually name it here. So it's going to be called uh, this. And we need to make sure this flip timer only runs once. Unfortunately, timers are preset. Their default value is to be a repeating timer. That means they'll, they'll time out again and again and again and again. We just want this flip thing to only happen when we call it to run and then stop after it happens, it times out once. So I'm going to tell flip timer to uh, set one shot. We're going to use this function uh, set one shot to true. And that means that it'll only count down once when it times out. Um, and we're going to add the flip timer to our game. We're going to say add underscore child and flip 
timer. And again, I'm not sure why we're adding it to a child of a code file that's not in our scene tree. This is an auto-loaded background, kind of a global scene. It still needs to happen. We're gonna do the same thing for our other timer, the match timer. So I'm gonna copy all of this, Control C, Control V, and I'm gonna change this to match timer. It's going to time out when we declare a, oh, pardon me, I actually gave you the wrong name here. When we, when the match timer runs out, it's going to run a function called match cards and score. We are going to, when the timer runs out for the flip timer, we're going to call the turn over cards. I was looking at my notes wrong. Turn over cards function. Hopefully you didn't get too lost and confused why I was calling it match cards and score uh, for turn over or for the flip timer, okay? So if, when you flip the cards over, uh, we're gonna run a function called turn over cards when the flip timer runs out. When we detect a match, we're going to run a function called match cards and score. We need to make sure that we change everything in these three lines from flip to match. So flip timer becomes match timer. We're gonna make it count down only once and then uh, flip timer becomes match timer. Here, we're gonna add that into our scene. We will have one more timer in the next video, but let's go ahead and implement these. I'm gonna make a function called turn over card. So I'm gonna copy that uh, code. I'm gonna go down to the bottom of my script. I will uh, press enter and backspace a few times. And I'm gonna say func, I'm gonna paste turn over cards. We need round brackets, we need a colon. What happens when I turn over cards? Well, essentially, all of these lines of code. So I'm just gonna copy those lines because when we check the cards, if we wanna flip the cards over, we're going to uh, copy those. In fact, I'm gonna use Control X to cut that. I'm gonna paste them right here and I'm gonna outdent uh, Shift Tab to fix those lines so they all line up nicely. Now, that means that we're not doing anything if the cards are not a match here. Well, if the cards are not a match when I'm checking them, if they're not the same values, I'm gonna call the that timer, which is called flip timer. I'm gonna tell the flip timer to start. So this is where we actually call check cards, but only through a, a timer. So I'm gonna say, um, if they're not a match when I'm checking them, I'm gonna say flip timer start counting down from, and you put a number in here, I'm just gonna say one second. You can use a decimal number, I believe. So you can say 0 0.8 or 1.2 if one is not quite right, I think. But I'm gonna do a quick uh, save. And is this going to work? I'm gonna press play scene. And I'm going to flip two that are not a match. It waits a second, aha. So you could see both of them and then it flips them back over. If you flip two over that are a match, they fade right away. And so I'm gonna stop that from happening. I'm going to write a method called and we have the name of it right here, match cards and score, control C. I'm gonna make a method or function called that. I'll make it down here, func, I'll paste that, bracket, bracket, colon. What do I wanna do if two cards match and I wanna score? Well, I'm going to copy these lines of code, control X actually to cut them, and I'm gonna paste them right here, and I'm gonna shift tab to fix those. And I'm gonna go back up to uh, this check cards and I'm gonna call match timer and I'm gonna tell it to start. And it's gonna be the same one second and you can adjust that if you want, I think. So now if the cards do match, it's gonna call the match timer, which is a timer which will count down. And once that timer times out, that's what this thing is here. We've connected the match timer to and the flip timer to their timeout function, which is when the, the, the clock runs out on them when we've told them to start, or after we've told them to start, it'll run this um, timer, and then it'll run the appropriate method or function, pardon me. So I think we have it made. I'm going to just quickly minimize that and let you pause the uh, code or, or video if you need to, to get the code for yourself. If you're following along with me, I'll go down to the bottom. These are my two new methods, and uh, we don't have any more code below that, and then above that, we've got our check cards, which is where we're calling those timers from, or starting those timers from. And I think there's choose card as well. There's deal deck, fill deck, setup timers, and our ready, and our variables up at the top.
Okay, so I'm gonna go up to play scene and now hopefully if I click on two not matching cards, it wastes a second and then it flips them back over. It makes the pointers null again so I can click on two more cards. If the cards do match, it wastes a second and then fades them out. And, uh, and hey, that seems to work fine. Can I click on two more? Yes, I can. The problem here with my game right now is that all the numbers line up. So all the aces are here, all the twos are here, you know, all the fives are here. So it makes it pretty obvious. In the next video right away at the beginning in part two of two, we will fix that. We will shuffle the deck. That is amazingly easy. The last thing I'll do in this video is I'm gonna create a score. And uh, this is how we're gonna keep track of how many pairs of cards have been flipped over. In my game manager, I'm gonna make a score variable, var score, and I'm gonna make it equal to zero at the beginning of my game. And I'm going to now add one to this every time I have a matching pair. So I'm going to go down to the code where that happens, which is check cards. And here I get to decide, you know, do I want the, the score to go up right when the second card has been clicked on, or I, do I want the score to go up by one after a second when the cards actually fade out. Because I have this, this method or function called match cards and score, I kind of said that it's, you know, in this code here. So I'm gonna put it here. I'm gonna say score equals score plus one, or I could just say score plus equals one. What I need to do though, is actually have that on the screen. The user can't see their score. So maybe I'll just print out, you know, score here and that'll show in the output. In the next video, I'm going to obviously uh, continue with this game. We're going to finish it off. We're gonna make sure that the cards are shuffled randomly every time. We're also gonna make the heads up uh, display the HUD at the bottom, which shows you how many card pairs you have matched. It's gonna show you your timer. It's gonna show you how many times you flipped over a pair of cards. It's gonna also have a pause button to pause your whole game. It's gonna have a reset button to reset the game. And we're gonna add in a splash, like start title screen that pops up over the top of your game. And it's going to, the game is gonna have a uh, game over successfully matched all the pairs. Uh, it's gonna show you how many turns you, you took or tries you try to flip over cards and your uh, final time on the clock. Okay, uh, right now, it seems to work pretty well. And if I match two cards, you'll see that my score came up. If I match two more cards, two came up and one more, three came up. That will be it for this video though. If you like this video or if I've done something in it, please go ahead and click on that like button below this video. It really helps out me and my channel. And if you want to see more videos like this one in the Godot game engine or in Blender or other technology, click on that subscribe button as well and click the bell icon to be notified whenever I upload a new tutorial. Check out my Facebook and Instagram pages. In those two places, I post sneak peeks and previews of what I'm working on next. And of course, stay tuned for part two of this new year special. That should come up fairly shortly on my channel, but that'll be it for this one. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.